Get viewers, it's another Friday of the opinion what we're talking about. Trending issues that affect other people in Africa. My name is Okoma Gifty, and I'll be doing this with. Of course, my name is Eugene Evans, and like she rightly said, this is a moment where we get to lay down meaningful issues right here on our table, and we speak our minds for your benefit, for my benefit, and of course, the continent as a whole. Today, we'll be discussing the immense contribution of technology during this period, and how we can capitalize on it even after the pandemic. We'll be joined later on in the studios by a guest to have a conversation on the back of this. Of course, in Nigeria, the governor of River State, yes, so we has ordered and supervised the demolition of two hotels in River State over the violation of lockdown by the state government. Still in Nigeria, the woman that, that was alleged to be the first case of coronavirus in Benue State has come out to debunk the claim. These are many more guys to be talking about. And you all enjoy it. We'll be right back after this break. V Nation Pictures is a production firm in Ghana aimed at becoming the renowned production company in Africa and beyond. Services rendered include film production and editing, shooting of TV commercials and videos, photo shooting, event coverage such as wedding, engagement, parties, funerals, etc. Locate V Nation Pictures inside King Solomon's Heights on the Tampolini Street of the Community 18 Road. Contact V Nation Pictures on 030. 3962776 or 0240-289-952 for booking inquiries. You can also reach us on. Okay, guys, welcome back from that quick break. Let's go into the first story for today. The governor of River State here, so we can have supervised the demolition of two hotels in River State over the violation of lockdown by the state government. Before we dive into this case, before we dive into the story or start discussing anything on the story, let's see this video. Yes, this particular video has got a whole lot of tongues wagging in Nigeria. A whole lot of people talking about so many some people are being showing are showing how rude and how um saucy they can be online this man actually did this thing because of a reason he didn't just come out to do it just like that because he felt like doing it or because he is the governor of the state let's see the second video I want to have, uh, we said no for touch of work between this period because we do not have some people who are teaching and because of the past laws, unfortunately, the youth leader of PDP in this location, they are to unpack the past laws, they are doing their rights. All we have to apply is not from the other state. We said if any hotel operates, the government will bring down that hotel. So, what do you want to have told people that we are going to do? Bring our policy. Okay, you can actually see what actually led to the demolition of the, hot the hotels in the River State. Um, Eugene, what do you have to say about that? <clears throat> First of all, um, I understand the Nigerians complain about this whole thing and they are angry about it and all of that. But let's take it from this angle. First of all, I will say that I feel that the governor, right? Yeah. The governor. Yeah. I feel that the governor went to, to a little to the extreme okay. by actually bringing down the building. I feel that you have everything it takes to actually arrest the management of the hotel. Yeah. Now, because from his explanations, he's, he's actually been there or he's actually sent some prior notice to them to let them know that, you know what, close down your hotel for a while. And this is actually for a while. It's not, it's not something that's going to affect us. I know we are all praying that this whole thing will actually go away. But going to the extreme of actually demolishing the whole building, the demolition the building was... To me, it was actually insensitive on his part, and it was too much to extreme. Because one, after the whole pandemic is over and all of that, then how do they bring? They actually build the whole thing up again. So then, it has affected people working there, unemployment there, right there. It has affected people. I know that you are angry and all of that, but as a leader, if you you let your emotions actually over override your actions, but wait, then you end up taking wrong decisions. But but then again, he sent people to tell the hotel management or whoever that was in charge of the police, right? You see, to lock down the hotels for now because, according to him, majority of the cases that was traced in the same state 
you know, was actually people from the hotel and all that. Right. Now he has sent people to go there to tell them that, hey, for now, let's shut this place down. After a period of time, we will open the place. And those people in return, like, uh, kind of responded to the message he sent them. He beat those people up to the extent that they are even hospitalized. Fine. You see, that was actually telling him, and after after doing what you did, you still went to reopen your hotel. To me, I think um, they actually dared him too much. Yes, they and, dared him. And, and then, of course, I'm not saying this thing to actually support whatever the management of the hotel did uh, or whatsoever. Just and they are wrong on every level. I mean, these, the management didn't try at all because I feel that you know what is at stake. Yeah. Especially when each and every moment we actually wake up. We hear a spike in cases, not just in Nigeria, all around the world. That's yeah. how serious this thing has actually become. Here in Ghana, we are hitting about close to 5,000 cases. And it's serious. In Nigeria, same. This is very serious. So, he telling you to actually close down the hotel, shut it down for a while. It is not for his benefit. Right. So, but why mishandle yeah. whoever he actually sent to actually tell shut you. down the place? So, yeah. for me, that was wrong on every level. And this manager... Or whoever is actually no, it's actually it was actually the PDP youth leader in that um, particular state. He was the one that ordered for this um treatment on those guys. So that's what, so he the person must be arrested. Yeah, that's where he's in power. You have everything it takes. So don't don't actually channel. Yeah, don't channel that emotions to actually demolish that hotel when everything is set and done. You know how tough. This whole thing yeah. has even affected Some everyone financially. Some livelihood as depends on this. Yeah. You can imagine the number of workers that they will lay off yeah. simply because, because of this, this, because it cannot run again. So this is a, 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 this is a misplaced priority. I yeah. want a, a, or misplaced emotion, so to speak. But, but on because, the other hand, I think Nigerians are kind of um, very stubborn. But you daring the person to actually you mishandle the actually the people they say was and then the after place. you reopen the place is. It's like you're like trying to tell the governor that what can he do? Like you are daring him. So I, I think that is also wrong on his part. So first of all, I won't I won't blame just one person. The management of the hotel did wrong. And I feel I won't also blame the governor too much. I feel that was his way answer was in a way justified. Justified, but yeah. it maybe it was a little bit to the extreme of Straight demolishing out. the hotel. hotel. But I thought that he's trying to prove a point for you to know that at the end of the day, serious. someone is actually above you. So yeah. this is the way to go. Okay, guys, this leads us to the next story. Actually, the woman that, that was alleged to be the first case of coronavirus in Benue State has come out to debunk the claim. But before we delve into this matter, let's see the video. My name is Susan Idoko Okweni Lawani, 43 days in forceful detention. It stated I came into this country on the 28th of February. On the 28th of February, I was still in England. It also stated in that report that I presented myself to the hospital with fever and stooling on the 16th of March, which was not true. On the 16th of March, I was still in England. I came into Nigeria on the 22nd of March. Went to hospital on the 24th of March. So in the report, there was nothing to say that that report was my report. Based on that, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, still using that report and the name on it, and before I forget to say, the birthday, the date that was put in that report said 58 and 62. And I am not 58 and I am not 62. Permit me to say now that even if anybody has COVID-19 in Nigeria, they will not come out because of stigmatization. Personally, you actually, what do you have to tell us? No, personally, watching this video, there are so many issues to actually raise watching this video. Okay. And listening to this woman speak. Okay. It is very heartbreaking to actually hear her speak. I don't know how true her story is, yes. but from what she is saying now, she has actually she arrived in the country in the month of February. Okay. However, the report that is actually out there claims that he's she actually came to the country in March, which was wrong. So many inconsistencies. On that same report, she also stated that the age, the date of birth on there was a wrong date of birth okay. compared to hers. Yeah. So what if that report is not hers? And then the third thing also she also raised is the fact that 
even before you guys actually came to her to tell her to tell her about her status or whether he's positive she's actually positive, positive it was already out there with her name you guys are already holding press conference yeah with her name and, and all of that the first, yeah. it is so wrong on every level it is not done even in Ghana. Yeah, we don't know the things from where she's standing right now she tested boy she was no 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 proof to as in no proof for the government to show that oh she was a um, positive you see that and when she was standing, because you have run three tests on her and she has seen just one and even that one you're actually saying there, there are there so many inconsistencies in there and this woman has been in custody in your custody for, for, so, ah, for 43 good days and, she has, and the interesting twist about this opening she has refused taking the medication. medication for 43 days if indeed this woman as has the virus and is not taking the medication come oh, trust what me. are you guys oh, talking no. about you guys are being unfair to this woman on every level. And it looks like no one is actually there to speak on her behalf. And again, and again, the government's publishing it and making it look like, oh, it's a death warrant. It's not actually cool because it brings this stigmatization. Yes, it's stigmatization. Because yes. she said something very interesting in the last bit of the video. She said, even if she actually has the virus, virus. is this the way to, to go? Home, yeah. You don't do that. Even if the person has the virus, you don't disclose the person's identity. What do you do? You take the person to... Either wherever, whether I saw isolated place or wherever they call the police to actually treat the person, take yeah. the person through the you know the treatment and all of that because people are still recovering anyways. Yeah. So that is the way to go. But her case is different. So what makes her case different? Yeah, yeah, you know, um that is the same thing like when people in Nigeria majority of the people in Nigeria are like ah, the NCDC are just bringing out the numbers, bringing out the numbers to show us. I think stigmatization is still the same reason why people don't actually bring out, they don't actually bring out people's faces and people's um, videos. Exactly. And so eventually you're promoting this thing, like you don't want people to stigmatize each other because of this coronavirus issue. So why then are you coming out to you, the government yourself, you know, that is helping the NCDC, you're coming out to picture this woman out. Like she mentioned her name, even when she actually claimed she tested negative, no proof to show she tested positive. And it also questions the integrity yes. of whoever actually did the test and of, the, of course the governor and all, all of that. And that is why there are people out there who so doubt the fact that we have some cases yes. of coronavirus yeah. there because they feel that oh, the government just put some numbers together and they are like, these are, the, these are the numbers in something. order to actually get something from WHO or whoever is yeah. actually giving them money and all of that. So this is so wrong. Someone needs to listen to her. Yes, she is a citizen of your yeah. country. Let's do something about it. But, but, but come on, keeping someone's mother for how many days? It's, it's, three days. it's totally out of You can imagine how it's, it's an effect it's mentally. mentally. Oh, come this on. is wrong on every level. Anyways. We just hope that they will listen to us even whilst we are saying someone will actually come to hear it and someone, the president of Nigeria, this is the time to, you need to speak up for your citizen. Now, we've got so much, so, so, so many issues to touch on right here on this particular issue. When we come back from the break, we'll be talking about the immense contribution of technology, technology I beg your pardon, during this period and how we can capitalize on it after this pandemic. We'll be right back after this break. V Nation Pictures is a production firm in Ghana aimed at becoming the renowned production company in Africa and beyond. Services rendered include film production and editing, shooting of TV commercials and videos, photo shooting, event coverage such as wedding, engagement, parties, funerals, etc. Locate V Nation Pictures inside King Solomon's Heights on the Tampolini Street of the Community 18 Road. Contact V Nation Pictures on 030 Three nine six two seven seven six or zero two four zero two eight nine nine five two for booking inquiries. You can also reach us on. You're welcome back from the break. Now, if you just joined us, this is still the opinion right here on VNTV. Please don't forget to get interactive via various social media platforms. On Facebook is VNTV, on Instagram and YouTube is VNation TV. And if you don't have the app, all you need to do is to go to Google Play Store and download the app and enjoy some great content. Now, you would realize that technology has played some key roles and facilitated uh, certain activities during this period. I mean, we've had schools having classes online. Uh, we've had virtual uh, concerts and all. Now, the question we are asking is, how can we keep up with this realization even after the pandemic? To help us with this discussion, we have right here in the studios the um, founder and president of Hack Lab 
Foundation. He is also the incubator manager for Stanbeck Bank Incubator Ghana and also a member of Standard Bank Group. And he serves actually as, as a business analyst of the digital transformation team. His name is Foster Awintiti Akugri. I got the name right. You're welcome to the Opinion Show. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Now, before we even delve deeper into the discussion for today, tell us briefly about Hack Lab Foundation. Okay. So the Hack Lab Foundation is a non-profit organization. Uh, we are focused on preparing the youth for future jobs. And we are very biased towards technology because it's going to be the future. So we advance technology education across Africa and the rest of the global south. Uh, we've been in operations for the last five years uh, with keen focus on Ghana. Uh, we are currently working on our expansion into India, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia and a couple of other uh, countries where there's close to zero innovation or activity going on around education on, on technology and entrepreneurship. And for me, this is a personal motivation uh, from the fact that I had a privilege to have met the right people who gave me the right opportunity to be where I am today. And so I believe using that instrument and the platform I have today to help other people is what would help us build the nation. And I think you are doing abs an absolute, absolute good job. I mean, consider the fact that you're very young and you're actually making strides in, in that field. Now, but let's talk, let's talk about the reason you are here, one mm. of the reasons we are here. Now, how has the growth or progress in the use of technology been over the years, especially in, in this part of the world? Mm. This, this, uh, the growth was gradual in the early 2000s yeah. and in the last five years we've seen a significant growth as compared to the previous years. Things are moving way faster than before. Every single day uh, a new technology is invented or discovered and it totally transforms the way we live our lives, the way we work, the way we communicate and the way we live. And a significant uh, example to, to justify that is the, the use of mobile phones. Mm. The subject of financial inclusion was always an issue about five, ten years ago. Today, mobile money has solved that problem significantly. To Absolutely. The everybody can own a bank account or everybody can own an account that's can you can track the history of that person and lend credits to that person you can make all the transactions exactly. just in your in your hand you have so, all that so now the farmer who lives mm. in the village who wasn't who was sensitive about giving their money to a bank can now use mobile money and feel comfortable about it because he holds his money wherever he goes. He feels he holds his money yes. wherever he goes on and his it's phone. Safe anyways. Exactly. And he, he's the only one who has the password to be able to transact. And so and he needs when he needs the money he can get it instantly. There's no working around the clock eight to five and so the bank is closed yes. or the bank doesn't work on weekends, so I cannot access my money. You can access it twenty four seven and this is what's really solved for the use cases around how do we get everybody financially included. Mm -hmm. And now that we've been able to unlock that financial power of everybody, it's easy for people now to purchase and access other services like buying data, buying airtime, paying for utility bills. Because now one of the major challenges of, of being able to scale anything is whether it will, it will be sustainable and mobile devices have come to solve a lot of that, those problems. Right. So everybody, ECG, water bill, everything, pain fees, everything is now can, can now be controlled from your phone. And this convenience and comfort is what has allowed the spread of technology to increase far, far wider than expected. It's become a convenience. And so if every household, according to GSMS report, at least one, every, in every household, there's at least a single mobile device or one person who owns a mobile device that can be used for the entire household. And this is bridging the subject of communication, where at least if one person at home has the phone, you can all use it. Uh, there are technologies like voice uh, SMS, which mm -hmm. is now allowing for companies like uh, PharmaLine to, to help translate weather forecasts 
to illiterate farmers in their local languages. So they subscribe to it and they're able to get professional agri extension services to help most of them who are in subsistence farming to gain knowledge in when to plant, what, when to apply fertilizer, the, the, the application of drones to, to test soils and soil samples and all of that to advise local farmers has, has also improved significantly. So when you look at technology at, at its most basic form and its most advanced mm. form, and you categorize people from the low class to the high class, everybody is being significantly impacted by technology. But why or how did it take the outbreak of the coronavirus virus for us to realize the magnitude of technology? That's if we have realized that in full anyways. Because like I said early on, we see people now using it yeah. often now. Mm. We see the virtual concerts being held now. We see it has made it possible for even businesses to hold meetings and all yeah. of that. Why has it taken us? Why must this thing happen for us to realize the importance or the magnitude of the use of technology? First of all, change... The narrative. Change is one of the most difficult things to achieve, especially people transformation. Mm. And so every time something new is introduced, that is not a normal to the person's uh, lifestyle. Mm. It takes... The first stage of change is resistance. Then you come to accept. Then you now become uh, comfortable with using it. So after you accept, you start to learn and it becomes a part of you. When it becomes a part of you, you become addicted to it. That anything new that has to replace that old thing you're addicted to becomes difficult for you to accept. So it's a cycle. That's, that's the same thing technology has uh, that's the same application in technology. Now, two years ago, we were talking about the subject of the fourth industrial revolution, where um, biological spheres, uh, chemical spheres, and uh, technology are going to infuse. So you start to have uh, biochips that are inserted mm. into your body. That yes, can, yes. And I then remember. you have... Uh, 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 bots that can go into your body they are injected into your body and they can perform surgeries wow, wow. you get it and so so to be able to cure things like cancer and all they go into the body they are targeted they are targeting cancerous cells and they are killing them this is how advanced technology is going to become um, it's going to become so advanced that people's brains can even be stimulated and there will be no damn person on earth you be able to manipulate anyone to be as sharp as like you can have maybe a thousand military men all of them with the same level of capability imagine how powerful that can be now i talked about the subject of change mm -hmm. it it took necessity there's a saying that necessity is the mother of, of invention, invention or innovation mm -hmm. it took necessity for us to appreciate the the the, the campaign that has been going on because mm. in the workplace for example there are different generations or let's let's consider this current uh, generation we are in mm. or this current time quantum of time we are in there are about four generations that currently exist and each of these generations came to meet a certain lifestyle right the last two generations which are gen y's and z's are used to uh, technology or they, they came to meet the evolution of technology. So they see it as a lifestyle. Mm. They see it as it is a normal. The people before them who now sit in leadership roles and make the decisions as to whether we should adopt technology at scale are the born before computers who really understand it. So they have what high resistance to it. They've lived two or three generations. That's about 40, 60 years. And so you are introducing something new to them which they do not fully understand. Right. And the human body naturally would resist anything it doesn't really understand. And that is what the challenge was before COVID. Now, COVID had to force businesses to continue to operate or die. Right. And had to force people to find alternative ways to sustain the social interaction they had. That is why you saw spikes in downloads on Instagram, house party, Zoom, Zoom yeah. Skype, 
everything has like all forms of alternate communication channels have become more relevant now than before because of the subject of social distancing right and because of how our communities have been developed that we have to socially interact as humans to survive so it has brought forth the the need to people people now see it now they are forced to learn how to use these tools whether they like it or not and there's no single business today that is running during this COVID period that can boost off not using technology that's true one day that's true. either you making a phone call mobile uh, receiving money mobile money transactions going to the hospital or calling to make an appointment before you even yeah. going to the barbering shop you now have to call to make an appointment because you can't have a lot of people there yeah. and you don't even feel safe going there because you don't know how many people will be there when you get there yeah. so everybody is now using it supermarkets are now doing delivery yeah, yeah. Pick up, pick up. Exactly. Delivery. So, it's it's like we were waiting for COVID to hit for the revolution. And I, and I, and I, I have a confession too. I mean, uh, up until now, I mean, I've heard about Zoom and all of that, but yeah. I haven't tried. I didn't see the need to try. Exactly. It, now, I mean, <laughs> I try Zoom and I'm like, wow, this is cool. Exactly. Right. So, so mm -hmm. I, these systems have now been optimized significantly to allow for us to have calls smoothly, even with low bandwidth because of the high pressure on, on internet services, they've been able to negotiate with the ISPs to also cut down the cost of being able to use some of these costs. Initially, if uh, per, per every minute you were spending maybe three, four megabytes on, on a communication channel, voice over IP, now you'll be spending maybe one megabyte per a minute on, on a communication channel. So these things have become like incentives to allow us to continue to use them. Now, it's, the COVID period is enough time to transform the lifestyle of people. You know, there's a saying that your, your routine becomes your attitude, your attitude develops into your character, right. and then your character becomes a lifestyle. Yeah. That is exactly what is happening. From much up until now, people have already transitioned through that whole phase. Mm. Some people are still transitioning, depending on how frequently they are using these platforms. And so... Imagine going back to the old way. It would look awkward, yeah. weird. Yeah. Oh, like you now have found... You've grown accustomed to... Like, exactly. Yeah. The new you found a much now. more convenient mm. way. Yeah, it's like you spent two hours in traffic to get to work. And now you can actually just wake up at 6 a.m. and start working without... Mm. And save that productive house. time. So if you're an organization and you have a, a thousand square meter space... Yeah. and have 500 employees to sit in that square meter space every day. And within during COVID, that space has been empty for three, four months and you paid rent for it. Well, what would be your business decision? You downsize the space. Absolutely. Yeah. And encourage more employees to work from home. The call center can be set up. Everybody, call center, a lot of the telcos have their call centers set up at home for their employees. Some companies, when COVID hits, they just told everybody, take your workstation. Uh, the, a driver will come and pick up your workstation, deliver it to your home, configure your internet for you, and then you sit at home and work. Everything now should, be, should people wow. be afraid? Should some of us be, some people out there be worried now? People will be laid off. I mean, considering the fact that now we don't see the need for you to come all the way to the work. workplace to actually work. The subject, should they be worried? The subject of technology mm -hmm. making people lose jobs has always been there. Now, it is not just technology. For every industrial revolution Absolutely. that happened, people who were not prepared for the new normal will lose their jobs. Those who prepare to transition from what their old job looks like to what the new job that is close to what they used to do mm. before looks like would survive it. So education has now become most of the, uh, the, one of the easiest to uh, access in the world, information you can access online courses for free. During this COVID period, a lot of schools, online schools, waived off the fees to take courses. If you are somebody like me who likes to learn every day, mm -hmm. like I can take like 12, 15 courses in a month, spend one hour on each course a day, and by the time you realize in 12, 10 days, you've completed each of the courses. So if you, if you take advantage of this, maybe you were supposed to pay $2,500 to learn to become a data scientist and now you have access to it for free. Wow. 
why won't you learn it first and update your profile on your mm -hmm. company portal and then you and tell your HR that I have acquired a new skill. I want you guys to repurpose me to a new department where they'll find me relevant. If they are laying off employees, would they lay you off? No. No. So it is time for us to wake up and start to see if you stayed at home this last few months right. and you were really called the whole week by anybody to ask you to do something. You should know that you are going to lose your job. Wow. Because you are not really relevant. Because before you used to come to work every day, so they see you at work and you are attending some few meetings, shows that you are doing something. But now you are home and nobody is calling you, nobody needs you for anything. Yeah. Then you are obviously going to be laid off. So you have to start finding something new to do. And technology again. So for every job that is lost, several jobs are created. I love that. For every job that is lost. And I'll take a classical example, mm. the ATM. Before the ATM, you, when you enter a bank, you see a long line of tellers mm. waiting to serve customers. Now, when the ATM came in, tellers lost their jobs. That's so true. now you enter a branch and there are like four or five tellers as compared to before when there were 20 to 30 tellers. Yeah. Now, this allows for... It allows for a new department to be created to man the entire operations of the ATM. So before the ATM, there was no credit card. There was no debit card. That means whoever produced that plastic didn't have business for that. Yeah. Now, for the card alone to be produced, there's a company that produces So they've created it. There's another. There's a company that brands it. Even though yeah. now we don't have the number of exactly. tellers. In there's it. a company that manages the chip on it. Mm. There's a company that builds the software that powers the card. Then you come to the machine. In the bank, there's an ATM custodian who goes to load the money. There's somebody who checks to ensure that money is not, the, if the money is running down. Right. If there are issues, there's somebody who comes to fix hardware. Yeah. There's somebody who fabricates the design around the ATM machine. There's somebody who in, installs and maintains the software on the ATM. There's somebody who manages security around yeah. it. There's somebody who does reconciliations and all of that. Yeah. So there's a whole new line mm. of jobs that have been created. Absolutely. So if you look at, for example, they say they're automating surgery. The doctor is still relevant because the doctor's knowledge is what to be used by the machine to perform the surgery. Mm. If you were a doctor and you were a surgeon, you would start to innovate or you start to acquire new skills that will make you an expert in helping organizations that build those robots to perform the surgery. So don't don't actually wait no. for something to actually happen before. Start to transition. Start. Right. If you were selling in the supermarket and now you ha your customers are ordering online, what will you do? Build a virtual store online. Mm. Upload your inventory online. Right. Let people shop online and then you deliver it to them right. in their homes. Okay, um, sorry. Um, talking about um, online and connectivity, mm. okay, I know we are in this part of the world where the internet and all that is kind of slow. Mm. So how do you think um, sustaining, um, sustaining the technology by the connectivity and charges on data, what do you think? How do you think you can sustain this? So um, it's, it's, a co it's supposed to be a collaboration thing. Okay. And uh, ISPs, so it's, it's, first of all, let's go, who regulates the, mm -hmm. the internet, uh, the spectrum, the data or communication spectrum, the National uh, Commission, mm -hmm. National Communications Authority, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Now, they, they charge these telecommunications to open spectrums for them to, to, to broadcast whatever it is so that we can have access to communication devices uh, smoothly. The cost of the taxes on and licensing to be able to operate in these spectrums are extremely high. Okay. For you to run a sustainable business, you obviously have to pass on the cost to... Uh, it adds up to the cost, the selling price. Because mm. yeah. you calculate your cost price in exactly. terms of your yeah. total cost of production. And yeah. then you add your margin to it and then you sell it to the user. We are the end consumers. Mm -hmm. yeah. If the license of NCA and taxes, on, on, uh, and taxes and tariffs on communication it continues to increase... We are the ones who bear the cost of it. Yeah. You get it. Now, if they are able to lower that, uh, uh, how do you call it, lower that cost, that means it forces telecommunications companies to also lower the data charges. The charges. The, the so it has to start from the top. Exactly. Yeah. 
So the, the government needs to create mm. that enabling environment for the telcos to also create that enabling environment for us. It's a whole value chain. Mm. Yeah. Now, that aside, for access to education, online education, access to certain types of services mm. like healthcare, etc., etc., um, companies need to collaborate with telecommunications companies to absorb that cost, to increase, to allow for users to want to. So now some of the banks have their apps. You can use their apps on any network for free. Right. Because they've zero rated the cost right. on being able to use their app on a particular network. And they absorb that cost. They can pass it on to you in another way. Okay. You get it. And so these are incentives that organizations need to put in place. Now, for organizations that are doing just for good, for example, Hack Lab, we, 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 we deploy open access, uh, we deploy online education for people for free. Wow. So, wow. And we do this in collaboration with IBM. I think we have to make some time <laughs> for you to come and so we talk about Hack Lab Foundation. <laughs> because I, I think you're doing it's an amazing job. We try. We try. Yeah, really amazing. I job. think so. So it's it's more of doing less of the complaining and mm. taking action. Mm. I always say that if you see a problem and you complain, you are marking time and you are standing still. The yeah. part of the change. Yeah. If you <laughs> want to see change, mm. then you have to move mean, mm. action. Yeah. You have to be action oriented so that you can move things forward. And we are doing something in a very little way. It has a ripple effect on every other person mm -hmm. who joins our community and also decides to extend the opportunity for people. And so telecommunications companies need to collaborate with some of these organizations that are, are s for social good mm. and not for profit. Right. Yeah. To, to waive off that cost of being able to increase the number of people who have access to these okay. things. It's a win-win situation. As people transition from not being able to afford to being able to afford, mm. they would leave our spectrum of learning how to develop a skill into the spectrum when they can afford to pay for the service and so you can now have them mm. pay for it. Right. So it becomes like a delayed gratification. Now, if we look at business models that we for businesses and for collaborations with ISPs, we can guarantee that if 10,000 of our community members gain employment fully, one way or the other, we can cross-sell the services of the telecommunications company to our community members at an exclusive package type of product. And then find a way to carry on the charges that were delayed into the new products for the people. At the end of the day, <laughs> it's a win-win situation for everybody. So mm. we just have to be very innovative in right. how we collaborate with telcos, uh, ISPs, and, and all the other players in the ecosystem right. to drive technology. Now, now, lastly, how do we keep up with this realization even after this pandemic? So I talked about lifestyle. Mm. Uh, we are transitioning. Mm. In the next six months, if we are still in this partial kind of lockdown uh, type of uh, environment mm. people will be forced to live a new life and they will become used to the new life i shared a, a, a post on linkedin some time ago which was comparing where we are now which is the COVID period to where we were before and where we where mm. then we would be after COVID. Mm. and then the question is people make a statement i want i wish things were back to normal yeah how about you reconsider I am looking forward to the new normal mm. yeah. where you don't have to wake up and think about going to work, but you wake work up straight to home. work. Straight to work. I like that. Where you, you can get to participate more, you can spend more time with your family yeah. than like rushing, rushing out all the time. time and it's only weekends that you have time you have together. Time. Right. Where you can get to interact more with your friends through digital channels without limitations of, oh, I wasn't able to see you this week, so like, let's reschedule, yeah. or blah, blah, stuff like that. Where physical limitations no more become an excuse for people to be more productive. Mm. And so we, we need to look forward to that new normal where there will be fewer cars on the road. That means fewer carbon emissions. Mm. That means 
better air to breathe. That means climate change, change. Re reduction. Yeah. And the ripple effect goes on and on and on and on. Governments will have to now reinvent how they generate income, interne internally generated funds, right. by revising their business models, by finding a way to digitize a lot of their processes so that people can pay their taxes appropriately, mm. so that people who work online and get paid off mm. on, on the table as in two digital channels, mm. obviously, you can still find a way to tax them. To do your deduction. And all exactly. Mm. And so all these agencies, private institutions, public institutions, and us individuals need to come together to understand that things will never be normal again. Mm -hmm. And we need to start accepting that and finding ways to do things better. Well, like you said, let's do, let's do better or find ways to do better. Thank you so much, um, Foster. I win three. I win three. I could agree. I like that name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've been speaking to the president and founder of Hack Lab Foundation, and this session has been very, very insightful. Anyways, that's it for today's edition for of the opinion right here on VNTV. My name is Eugene Evans, and I've been doing this with. Of course, my name is Okoba Gifty. You can follow me personally on my Instagram handle at Gifty underscore Ada. You can still follow my stylist on her Instagram handle at Shine underscore Couture. Well, talking about following, you can still follow us on all social media platforms on Facebook, VNTV, on Instagram, and YouTube, V Nation TV. And do download our app on Google Play Store. Enjoy great content. Same time next week, we'll be here to do what we do best. See you next time.